Essentially, the question is uh, problems in the regulated era that farmers are facing as far as uh, rigorous testing procedures, um, failing for contaminants that we didn't even know existed, um, and maybe some possible ways that we can mitigate those uh, difficulties. Uh, so uh, a little background about myself, I guess. Um, I use a microscope to analyze soil biology. Um, I've been working with Elaine Ingham for the past three years very closely. Uh, she offers some classes online. Uh, I took those early on and then continued with everything she put out there. I took the uh, online classes that Dr. Elaine Ingham offered uh, and at a certain point if you finish all the classes you have the opportunity to work on a one-year mentorship where you become uh, certified. Uh, when I started that it was in the infancy of the program so I got to work directly with her on that and um, she literally walked me through a lot of the procedures of helping some of these larger scale farmers make it at this new scale. Um, so that was a very valuable experience to have her interpret what I was seeing in the field. Uh, so I think that was a really unique oppor opportunity for me that was extremely valuable and um, has turned into some uh, really fantastic insights as to where the problems are starting and what are some rational, cost-effective solutions to get through that process and actually produce material that can be tested afterward and, and make it through the process. Um, so how we use the microscope in that situation is we can count the organisms in the soil and based on different populations or different ratios of organisms to different organisms, um, it can speak to the volatility or the stability of the system, which can also tell us um, where pest or disease pressure is likely to come from. And so when we move to this larger scale, we can look really tightly and specifically with this microscope and say, we actually have a problem in group two and bay three. We don't need to send employees in to spray everything every Monday. We need to address the underlying issue with the environment in the corner of the greenhouse. And being able to mathematically quantify what's happening in the soil, it's led to an intense understanding of how the environment is negatively affecting the soil that is negatively affecting plant health, which is leading us to use really toxic chemicals. By looking very precisely at the groups of plants across the facility, we can then zoom way out of that and look at it on a macro scale as like a uh, an F grade, a C grade, and an A grade. And F grades become red boxes on the thing. And we can, we can zoom out. And uh, an example that I just saw is, is five long beds in a greenhouse. And the water comes in at the center between bed two and three, and the pressure is highest there. And so beds two and three get overwatered and slightly saturated. And so they spend more time of the day not producing nutrients because the organisms are really specific specialists and they operate during uh, very tight tolerances of moisture. And so those two beds are creating an oversaturated event that shuts down nutrient cycling and negatively impacts soil stability. And so we can see that mathematically with the different organisms that are there or are not there and percentages of disease causing fungi to beneficial fungi. So we've been able to use the microscope to mathematically quantify the organisms in the soil which can give us an indication as to where the problem is coming from. Whether it's a hostile environment that's negatively impacting the soil environment or an overwatering event which is suffocating the aerobic oxygen loving organisms creating mold pressure or from overfeeding constantly overstimulating the system which is 99 percent of living soil farmers they are way overdoing it yeah because there's not enough to process this massive amount of nutrients we're trying to cram into the top of a pot right so so we have this really beautiful shift that's happening from people going from these really toxic really harsh uh, growing styles to more sustainable respectable farming styles and Literally, genuinely, the biggest obstacle to doing that is changing your mindset. And we're coming from a nutrient quantity style farming where we need to put this many PPMs into a reservoir to get a certain plant growth response 
and yield and turn that into a harvest. And if we take that mentality into the living soils, we're constantly throwing way too many nutrients on top to cram them into the system. And if we have a deprived biological system, meaning we only have bacteria, because that's all that's available in over-the-table products, and most compost lacks an actual soil food web, so most people are growing with just bacteria. In the soil, bacteria mineralize nutrients and store them in their body, so they're the fertilizer bags of the soil. And so for those to become plant available and do something beneficial for our, our plant, we need a predator to eat it and rip the top off of that bag and make it plant available for our plant. And that's literally what's happening. It's a bunch of things eating other things, creating nutrients. And almost everything that we're doing is hindering that thing and also this thing that is not there. And um, so we can zoom in really closely, count the organisms and zoom out and go, what is about the layout of this facility that's causing this situation? What is about our process that is creating a disturbance event in group two that is leading to pest pressure and disease susceptibility? An example of this would be standard 30 by 96 greenhouse with five long beds in it. Water comes into the center between bed two and three and that's where the water pressure is highest. So out of the drip tape, those beds get slightly oversaturated compared to the other five beds. This effect in its own can lead to pest and disease pressure later on in the life cycle of the plant for two reasons. Organisms are really specific when they operate with um, uh, moisture percentages being a big important factor. So as moisture gets too high, these organisms that are producing nutrients go to sleep and they go dormant and they wait till conditions become ideal for them to execute. And so when we overwater those beds, it puts everything to sleep and they're slower to wake up. So those plants have nutrient cycling issues. And if the water amount is too much after a certain threshold, you actually start to deprive oxygen so much that the dormancy becomes death. And the fungi and these other organisms that create soil structure naturally to allow the natural storage of the water um, die, soil structure collapses, and now it is the same effect to your root system as if a hydroponic reservoir took the aeration out. It's the same effect. So the same problems we see over here in hydroponics, when we don't have enough aeration to the root zone, that same thing is happening in our living soil bed. But we can't pick that plant up and look at the roots and see that they're brown and look like dready ropes because that's under the soil and we don't look at it that way. And so... Uh, um, so in that situation with the five beds, we just adjust the water and then we can count the organisms again and see that the tides have changed or if they haven't changed. Um, typically we can see if an effect or if a change was effective within seven to ten days and you can take a soil that is these variable, and then if that's correct. Not the variable that correct. Applies, you could be like, like, what would be another one in addition to like water? <coughs> Uh, straight up, most problems are from excess saturation right now. Um, I'll answer this more thoroughly, but an actual usable answer is we have an intense pressure on um, farmers from the investors to produce widgets. And so people are feeding twice a day, people are feeding multiple times a day, they're upping, they're upping, they're pushing, they're pushing, they're pushing, they're pushing. And from a biological standpoint, the floor of that abandoned rose grower house is loaded with disease causing fungi and spores and we can count those and see that and we just pour water all over this facility that the soil is loaded with water molds and um, those things spore and germinate and attack your plant and literally it's because they're water molds and they can only transfer on a film of water so the more times we leave a film of water everywhere that's the more we're spreading proliferating and creating disease fight um, so that's a specific answer but mathematically um, depending on <laughs> depending on the populations of the disease causing organisms we've just seen enough now that most people are following the same four trends most people are following the same four um, recommendations that have worked you know they have merit I'm not uh, discounting things we do because we're able to do them more than once, so there's a, a, meth, uh, a um, component of effectiveness that, that um, allows the technique to keep going. But as we move into the regulated era, 
the material we're producing is being more tightly analyzed. And a proactive approach can avoid costly errors in the end. And, and that's essentially when we've really done the most work is after somebody just had a, a confiscation, really. And so we talk about the confiscation, try to identify where the problem came from, try to change the soil environment so it's more conducive to thriving and not disease.